You guys, if you've got your Bible, you can go ahead and turn to John chapter 9. I was telling the first service, it's a little bit uh, different um, in regards to what I'm sort of like used to. You know, I, I, you know, I, I come from a church that is, uh, you know, like, you just kind of go up there and share what's on your heart. You just kind of, you know, uh, or the pastor might tell you, hey, I have a certain topic for you to talk about. But, but here you guys are on a lectionary, what's the help Yes, there you go. Lectionary through Lent season. And, and and so it's, you know, the text is already laid out actually years in advance for what's going to be talked about um, on this particular weekend. And um, but the, the great part about it is, is it always comes to be true that no matter what, because God's word is so true and it is a lie, that despite whatever you kind of open it up, it's like, boom, you're like, man, this was written two two years ago or three years ago, whatever, whenever it was laid out, this was particularly for me, you know. And the, the, um, so it's a little bit different than, than kind of what I'm, what I'm used to. So I'm kind of, you know, I was telling the first story, I feel like I'm a little bit like a round and square, but, but I'm going to throw it at you guys. And actually I'm giving you guys the same message, but just going to do a different little bit twist to it. Um, John chapter 9, verse 30 through 33, um, the actual text that we are looking at for the weekend is actually all the way from verse 1 all the way through to the end of that chapter, which is 34. So 34 verses, but we're just going to read um, these three and we're going to kind of build a um, little argument around um, these three scriptures. It says, it says, the man answered, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. You know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to the one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And let me just kind of give you some background of what's going on inside this text. We go back to verse um, 1. Uh, what, what happens is that Jesus is walking with his disciples. And he observes a man who is blind. And then there is an introductory question that actually starts off an array of questions inside of this text. They are from Scripture, we know that there are 13 questions that are asked. Now, if it was just was one question, I'd be like, okay, cool, that's awesome, I need to reflect on that, but yeah, whatever. You know, but then if there was two or three, I would be like, okay, why are these questions being asked? But the fact that, that there's 13 questions asked in this one section of text gets us to thinking that questions are very important. That questions in which that we ask people on a daily basis actually are very, very valuable. You know, because what questions do is they give us the information that is needed for us to make a decision. You know how many of you guys have been late coming home from, from, uh, from wherever you were at, and yeah, as you're entering the door, your, your, your mother or your father asks you, you know, where have you been? You know, as they ask a question like, like, like that, what they're trying to understand is, is that if they know where you've been, they know what you've been doing. They know what you've been around. And the idea, in the sense of us asking questions, it is a form of probing into coming to conclusions about life. Now, as we read this, 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 this text, it's, it's such amazing because this is actually the ending statement of this text. And what he's basically saying, this blind man, or this man that used to be blind, is he's standing before a bunch of people and he's saying, Hey, here I am. Look at me. And as he's saying, Hey, Look at me. What he's basically doing is he's pointing to the fact that he knows that his life in every single place in which he goes represents a miracle. It represents the fact that Jesus has come into his life. It represents the fact that he was once blind, but now he can't see. And if you're right, like, oh, well, I'm not really understanding where this is going. I'm not really understanding the whole argument of where you're going. Let me just tell you, go back to the beginning of the text. The text tells us that he was born blind. It tells us also that he was brought to a place and every single day he sat at this place and he begged. His world consisted of getting up in the morning and someone helping him if he did not walk on his own to a particular spot where he sat down and he begged for food. He begged for money. He begged so that he could just make it to the next day. And so we see that that's a very small world. 
Maybe his world existed only maybe four blocks. Maybe it existed just going right down the street. Maybe it existed just walking outside of his door. But his world was very small until the day. Until the day when Jesus saw him. Until the day when literally Jesus saw him as he walked with his disciples. And really the conversation says that Jesus saw him and then a question was asked. And the question that was asked was, well, well, who has sinned inside of this moment? It had, was it the mother or was it him? Was it the father? Was it him? Was it the great grandfather or was it him? And at this moment, as this blind man declares that he doesn't care about who sinned, all he cares about is the fact that I need something to eat. I need something. I need something that can just sustain my day-to-day process. And really, as we look at this text, it's, it's just so amazing and it's so, you know, complex and it's so like there's so many different ways in which you can go. But today, I want to talk about three questions that can rob us of intimacy. Three questions that can rob us from having the right relationship with Jesus. The three questions that can rob us from having the, the, the right type of response, the right type of behavior around other people that exist inside of our world. And as we look at these three questions, and, 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 and actually what they're framed around is they're framed around all 13 questions that exist inside of this text. The first group of texts, which is where the first group of questions, or the first segment of the question is actually asked, is what I've already told you to ask by the disciples. They have the whole idea of who sinned. And the thing is, so many times inside of our lives, we're looking for an answer that who cares about it. An answer that who cares who did that, who did that, but what is your responsibility that you're going to take inside of this moment? And the first question, in a sense, for us to avoid um, or, or to not destroy intimacy inside of our lives and the lives of other people is for us to, add, to not ask the questions of blame. Whose fault is it anyway? You know, like I like to tell people, you know, it's not my fault that I'm five pounds overweight. Why are you laughing? I'm only five pounds overweight. Why are you guys laughing? Why is that so funny, dude? Why are you over there laughing, huh? Okay, maybe it's a little bit more than five pounds overweight, okay? But the idea is that I can get into the process of saying, well, you know, it's, it's my DNA. You know, my mom and dad, you know, they're the ones who gave me this DNA. You know, my, my dad is skinny as all no house, so guess what? I mean, he didn't give me that DNA. You know, or I can blame my wife who keeps buying Oreo cookies, the double stuffed Oreo cookies too. You know, like the ones that you kind of, you know, Oreo, you can't just eat one Oreo. You gotta like make at least like an Oreo sandwich. You take off the thing, take it out, dip it into like another one. I mean, just the other, one day, just the other day, just the other day, don't lie. Confessions of a tank. Here we go. <laughs> stacked up like that, you know, and, and, and I just kind of like, you know, you just kind of bite into it and you eat it. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Don't sit up here and judge me. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, so, so the deal is, is I can blame them. I can blame my wife because guess what? If she didn't buy the Oreos, I wouldn't eat them. <laughs> or what I can do is I can look in the mirror and say, you know what? There's just some things I gotta stop doing. There's just some things that I gotta start doing. And the thing about it is with then this whole question of blame, when we try to figure out whose problem it is, what you're doing is just so much reflecting on what's out there than what's reflecting on what's in here. And God is basically saying that in order for us to get to the moment of bringing healing into people's lives is that you've got to stop having to focus on yourself and you've got to get to the place where you look beside people's issues and you literally say, I see something greater inside of you. I see hope. I see a a person that has the victory. And right now it might look broken, disgusted. It might be horrible. It might smell. It might be something that you don't even want to go do. But you've got to speak life to that thing. And you've got to say, hey, you know what? In the middle of this circumstance, in the middle of these things right now, I am not going to blame you, but I'm just going to bring life into the equation. And that's what Jesus did. And but, you know, but so many times, even when we walk around the streets, we walk around, you know, maybe we're about to ride a bus, or maybe we're about to jump in the car, or about to go do this, or about to go do that, and we see the issues inside of our world, and yet we say, well, that's the mayor's job to fix that. Well, that's the, the teacher's job. Well, that's bad parenting. Well, that's this. Well, that's that. You know, and Jesus is saying, stop blaming. 
and be the answer. Yeah. Be the answer that is needed inside of the equation so that somebody generations from now can look up and be just like this blind man was in the midst of the controversy, in the midst of literally people pointing and accusing that is able to say, hey, here I am. Look how good God is. Look at my life. If he can do it for me, he can do it for you. And it's so awesome because inside the story, it doesn't say Jesus was right there with him as the Pharisees were throw, throwing accusations at him and were being mean and being evil and being all the other things that religious people can be. It just says that he stood up with a sense of boldness and confidence about himself because he knew I can't blame anybody else for what's happening. I'm taking advantage of this opportunity and I know that in this opportunity I can stand before people that look at me with disgust, people who do not like me, people that don't like my miracle, and you need to understand there's people that aren't going to like the fact that you're healed. Yeah. They're not. Because it brings us to question number two. It brings us to the idea of the question of worth. Because the fact that you've gotten healed and that you don't live in that neighborhood anymore, and you don't drive that busted car that when you drive down the road, everybody hears it, boom, 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 and, and people think it's your radio, and then when they get up close, they realize it's actually your engine. Yeah. I, I had a car like that. <laughs> blessings, blessings. You know, and, and, and it's the thing is, is, is that as you are living this type of life, is that people begin to actually put labels on you. They begin to say, well, you're important because you do this. You're not important because you do that. Well, you're more important because the color of your skin is that way. Well, you're not important because you do blank, blank, blank. And, and the thing is, is the fact is that as we talk about these questions, these questions that bring that, 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 that cripple intimacies that we have to understand, the second thing is the question of worth. And do you understand the fact that you are about it? Do you understand the fact that there is nobody else on this earth that is like you? Some of you are saying, thank God. <laughs> but others of you guys just need to understand as you stand up in faith, as you stand up with the whole ability of God inside of you, is that there was question of worth and you are valuable. Despite whatever your parents have done, despite your education, despite, you know, what car you're driving right now, you are valuable. Despite whatever house you're living in, you are valuable. Despite whatever's inside the bank or whatever's not in the bank, you are valuable. Despite what others have spoken over your life, you have value. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how awesome is that? How awesome is that? It's just the realization that there is value inside of you, but when you understand the value in you, you also have to understand the value in other people. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's the reason why Jesus was able to enter into a situation and it wasn't dependent upon well, who did what, what, how did all that, and who passed the blame, because he understood I'm valuable. Yeah. And because I'm valuable, he's valuable. Because this person that was in this state, inside of this mindset of just, you know, all I know, all that he had ever known was complete darkness and sadness. He had never been able to walk around and maybe climb a tree. Inside our context of what we're talking about, this is someone that maybe would have never have ridden a bike, would have never have gone to the park to play basketball. Would have, would have never been the person of being able to go into the water and swim. I mean, how bad of a joke would that be? Push the blind man into the pool. You know, you know it's just, it just would have been bad. But it's inside of these moments where we get to see, okay, you know what? This is more than just, oh, I can't see, now I can see. No, this is the reality of his whole structure of being was changing. Yeah. And that's the exact thing that happens when we come into a relationship with Jesus. That's why we talk about you don't go where you used to go. You don't hang out with the people you used to hang out with. You sometimes don't talk the way that you used to talk. You don't sometimes even dress the way that you used to dress. Because your reality has completely been transformed. The reality of who you are. It? And you understand that in the sense that you have moved from the status of maybe you felt like I'm nothing. How can I ever accomplish anything? How can I ever do this? How can I ever do that? And all of a sudden, you need to understand is that with the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you, there is a sense of worth. There is a sense of value. And since there is value inside of you, there's value in other people. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so you treat people with value. You treat people with respect. You treat people as though you, you, you love them and you care for them. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but you know what has been the biggest challenge about us being here at the way is the hug time. Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Because I'm not a touchy feeling guy, you know what I'm saying? You know, I'm kind of like, you know, you're in my space right now. <laughs> but, I, but I remember when my pastor made, made Brian Stubbard, uh, Michael Stubbard, and, and, and he said, he goes, he goes, he goes, the reason why we do this is because some of you have never had a touch of intimacy in the whole entire week. And I thought about that, and I'm like, wait, wait, wait you know, I, I guess the reason why I don't feel like it's a necessity for me is because I have a loving wife. I have loving kids, you know, I have a loving dad, you know, they all give me hugs, they all say hi, high five, they come give me kisses and all that, but to imagine a world without that. Yeah. And so when I do it, I'm like, this ain't for me, but this is show enough for you. And sometimes you need to realize that some of the things that God wants to do in and through your life, they ain't for you, yeah. but they're for somebody else. and someone else can begin to walk and so that someone else can begin to live a life that is bigger than what they're living right now. Yes. And it's the idea of the fact that as we do this, we get to a level of intimacy, a, a, a level of, of, of understanding one another, a level of growing and maturity. You know, the, the whole idea is, is that when you understand you're valuable, you don't let the labels that other people put on you define you. You know, as this blind man is sitting up there, I mean, he doesn't even have a name. I mean, how, how rude is that? You know, we need to talk to John when we get to heaven. John, why did you not give this dude a name? You were there. You could have asked him his name. Hey, bro, what's your name? <laughs> but no, you have to wait till you start writing. You call him the man, the blind man. You know, um, so it's like, it's like it's just, just, just very interesting and all that. And so, and, and in that, he had this labelization of the blind man. But the great part about it is, is that after the encounter of Jesus, he became the ex-blind man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the great part about it is that even in like, the sex section, the community is asking questions and they want to know, is this the man? Is this the guy? Is this the guy that used to beg at the what's the name? And he began to say, yes, I am him. And so the great part about that today is that you might be dealing with issues, but guess what? A month from now, people are going to say, hey, is, is that the girl who had that lion problem? Lion. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> hey, is that the guy who used to sell drugs in the corner? Yes, that used to be me. And the thing is that you need to understand that there's a great label in which you can accept upon your life is that I'm not the person who does that anymore, but I am the new person. Yeah, yeah. I'm the person who used to. Yeah. I'm the person that was that. I'm the person who now is walking in a new authority because I understand that my worth wasn't based upon what I did, but now my worth is based upon an encounter with Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how cool is that? I mean, that's like, I mean, that's like life transformational right there. I mean, that, that's like the point where you don't understand. You don't just see yourself as you used to be, but you see yourself as you currently are. Yes. And so my worth isn't in the fact of being able to come up here and grab a mic and, and preach. That's not my worth. My worth isn't in the fact of what I'm able to do is, it's, as I said, a computer or design something or do it. That's not in my worth. If anything, the worth is in the fact that as I stand before you and I say, I used to be a stutterer. I used to be a liar. I used to be a cheat. I used to be this. I used to be that. That that's where my worth comes from because it wasn't based upon my own skills, but it was based upon the presence of God. How do you want to be treated? It's a great question. You want to be treated with honor. You want to be treated with respect. Well, begin to treat others as though they're valuable and as though they deserve the respect, as they deserve the honor, as they deserve. You know, I remember when, when I first got married, I used to pray mighty prayers because, you know, every newlywed husband prays mighty prayers to God. I'm going to show you the number one prayer is God, change this woman. <laughs> Show up inside of her life. You just start, you know, yeah, ha, you, just, you get loud about it. Yes, Lord, yes, yes, change her, Lord. 
Hallelujah. And you begin to name, maybe you like secretly find some oil somewhere and you wipe it on her forehead. When she sleep. <laughs> oh, nobody else did that? That's not normal? Okay. But I remember that the Holy Spirit said, hey, you know what, Teddy? It's not about you changing. Or it's not about her changing. It's not about you changing. That's the flesh saying that. It's not about her changing. It's about you changing. You change you, and you have the potential to change your environment. You know, that, that's why when we talk about great people, great men and great women inside the Bible, or we talk about great men and great women throughout history, the thing that made them so different was their ability to see not what was in front of them, but see what could be. And I believe that as Christians, when we understand the worth of people, is that we don't see that guy on the corner as an enemy, or as someone that we avoid, or as someone who, who, who's potential danger to us. What we see them as, we see them as a young man. We see them as a young woman. We see them as Jesus sees them. As an opportunity for his presence to come in and actually bring change. It's how we want to destroy questions that destroy intimacy is the first question is questions of blame. The second one is questions of worth. The third question is questions asked by the Pharisees. is questions of credibility and experience. People always want to knock your credibility. People always want to knock your experience. They want to know, well, who was there? Well, who really laid their hands on you? Well, are you sure that that was really Jesus? You know, and they just start questioning. They start, like, nicking away at it. They start, like, and all of a sudden, you begin to question the experience in which you just had. You know, and it's very interesting because the disciples, they did this in a very strategic way. They did this, first of all, in the sense they attacked the credibility of the healer. They attack Jesus. And we see our society still doing the same thing. Did he really have a virgin birth? Did he really die on the cross? And in three days was raised again? Those are attacks of credibility. Because guess what? You take those things out of the equation. And then all of a sudden he just becomes an ordinary man. He becomes someone, a historical figure that has just existed on our planet, and that's it. But yet we know because of our experience, because we know that as we sing songs like we did this morning, and we're celebrating, and we're dancing, and we're clapping, and we're singing loud, and we're rejoicing, is that we're not just singing songs because that's a cultural expression of how we work and what we do. No, it's more than that. And it is an expression of what God has done inside of our lives. As we look at our lives and we say, you know what? I should be toe up, and I somewhat I am toe up, but yet with God, I'm not as bad as I would be. He said, I'm not as bad as toe up as it could be. Because guess what? Because the presence of God has been there. Because Jesus, all throughout the way, has been invited into the situation, into my encounters, into my behavior, into my language, into how I dress. He has been added into every element of who I am. And as we do that, we cannot allow people, we cannot allow our minds to just say, oh, you know, Jesus is just Jesus or whatever. No, 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 no. He's the Son of God. He was both, you know, there was a sense of humanity, but yet there was a sense of divinity that, that was in the divineness that was inside of him. You know, and they mixed them together. Now, do I understand it completely? No, I do not. But yet I press forward. Because I look at my life. Because I look at my situation. Because I look how at times how I respond to things. How I respond to my wife. How I respond to my kids. And then all of a sudden I start feeling like this conviction. And I know inside that conviction that's the Holy Spirit speaking to me. Saying, no, 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 no. You can't talk to her that way. You can't talk to him that way. You can't talk to them that way. Maybe that was me prophesying that I'm having a point. I have three girls by the other way. Be accepted, Lord. Be accepted. Be accepted. Except, come on, let's just everybody come to the front, stretch your hand, and let's just pray, pray over. I need an Allen boy in the household. We need to be something. I, I am 
my hand, my, my, my dad said, hallelujah, Jesus. Yeah. So, you know, we, 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 you know, I also have four beautiful, oh, I have one beautiful woman, I have four beautiful young girls inside my house, and, and so it's just, yeah, it's challenging times. <laughs> Uh, amen. <laughs> so one of the questions that they asked him, the Pharisees do, is they ask this question, which is a very interesting question, is what food is he to you? And so I ask you this question, who is he to you? Is he someone who's standing up in heaven with a bat ready to just swat you the moment that you do something bad? <laughs> Or is he a loving God that comes to you, that, that you go to? A heavenly Father who you go to and you're like, God, you know what, today I lay down my, my selfishness, I lay down my agenda, and I say, God, leave me. Direct my path. Do something amazing in and through my life. Are you praying prayers like the prayer of Jabez? God, expand my territory. But you need to understand that the expansion of your territory first begins inside of you. And you understanding your work. Understanding the fact that, that you cannot question the credibility of what God and who God and experiences in which He's doing in and through your life. And I'm telling you right now, I've heard some people's experiences with God. And some of them are weird. Some of them are a little bit like, are you serious? God, please do not speak to me that way. But it's not my job to literally criticize it. It's not my job to sit there and say, well, you know, you didn't check off the five things, and because these five things don't fall into this thing, you know, I don't think God spoke to you. No, 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 no. It's just my job literally to say, okay, cool. All right, well, let's pray about it. Okay, well, let's look at that in regards to the scripture. Let's evaluate it. Let's go through this together. As we are on this journey together, let's just... Let, let, let's get out of the thing of judgment. Let's get out of the thing of I've got to ridicule it. I've got to pick it apart. No, let's get to the part where we celebrate the fact that someone is being heard. That's hearing the voice of God. Yeah, you know, one of the other things in which they were credited, credited, trying to be credit is the credibility of parents. Because guess what? They knew that if the parents lied, there really wasn't born a boy who was blind. If there was no boy who really was blind, then guess what? Jesus had nothing to perform a miracle with. And that's probably why Jesus in the beginning of the text says, no, no, you, you guys are asking whose fault it is, and all I'm trying to tell you is that this just gives me an opportunity to show people how awesome I am. And you might be looking at your situation saying, well, this is this, this is that, this is that, blah, blah, blah. Stop looking at that. And just realize that your life or this experience that you're going through right now is going to give God an opportunity to give other people an opportunity to shout. Yeah. And you're like, well, how do you know that? How do you know that that could be true? Because later on in the text, this, this is what he says. He asks a question. The blind man the man who probably wasn't educated, the man who probably didn't know, you know, anything, anything. He just is literally, he's excited about the world. He's excited about life. He's excited about everything. Why? Because he's doing something that he never was able to do before. Yes. And even on that note, when you pray your prayers, are you praying prayers of restoration or are you praying prayers of healing? And my ideal is in a sense, I think we need to stop praying prayers of restoration. We need to start praying prayers of healing. Because God never, Jesus never healed somebody and restored them. He always healed them completely. And as you heal someone completely, you're able to do things and say things and go places that you never were able to do before. And so it's just this idea of just thinking a little bit different. But as we do that, my timer just went off. So I'm going to land the plane right now because Pastor Donner talks bad about me when I go long. He <laughs> says, do you want to become, he asks the question of life. He first of all goes, again, I've got to tell you this story. Then he goes from again, I've got to tell you this story, to do you want to become his disciples too. That too gives us a broader picture of something that's going on. It gives us the picture that not only possibly did he become a disciple of Jesus, 
but that there was others who became disciples of Jesus. And so you need to understand that your healing, that your miracle, that if we want to reach a level of intimacy, that the right questions that we need to be asking are questions of life, questions of hope. So that we can stand before our Sanhedrin. So we can stand before those that we're at work with. We can stand before those in the sense that we do life with inside of our communities, inside of our neighborhoods. And literally say, hey, look how good God is. That you can literally look before people, despite whatever they knew you before, when you were doing whatever you were doing. That you can go before them without fear, without condemnation and say, hey. Look! <laughs> How good God is. Amen. And you need to understand that as you're sitting here right now, that you are a testimony of something that God has done. Yes. That you are not here this morning just by chance. Oh, I'm just here because I woke up a little bit late, was supposed to go here and decided not to. No, 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 no. Remove the chance for it. Remove the karma. Remove all the other worldly ideas that are inside of our mind and understand that you are here because you are valuable. Yes. You are here because God wanted you to have an experience. You are here because you are a testimony of what God can do. Yes. as I sit up here and I'm going to end with this story so she doesn't throw anything at me but I'm in with this story is that as, as, as we look at even in my own life and again a little bit of music you guys come up here serenade me and I hope you'll go a little land <laughs> is that when I was four years old my mom and it was the greatest thing that she could have ever done. The greatest thing that she ever could have done. Looking back at it, the greatest thing. Is my mom decided, I can't take care of this young man. This young little nipper snapper. So I'm going to give him to his grandparents. And really inside of my mind, there's been a disdaining image. There's been like a, I don't even know this right word. There's been like an image that's implanted inside of my mind. And it's the image of that night when she left me at my grandparents' house. And it was in San Francisco, over the Visitation Valley, off of Campbell Street, and just kind of you guys that know, you know, when you go to San Francisco, it's like you walk upstairs, like she gets out to the front door. You know, it's not like you just kind of walk down and they go up the front. But I remember that my room was like looking over into this walkway, and I remember that as she dropped me off, I remember me saying, Mom! Mom! Don't leave me. Be banging as a four-year-old. And then I remember running over to the window and looking out and watching her get into the car with, with her then brand new husband. I think they only know if they were married yet, but she was leaving to start a life with, with him without me. And I said, they're baby, baby, mom, don't leave me. Mom, don't leave me. She didn't look up. Didn't see her for probably another 14 years. And for so many people inside of our world, they would look at that story and they would say, based upon just that fact, I would become a statistic. That I probably should be in jail. I probably should not have a master's degree. I probably, you know, should have really go down the laundry list of things that statistically people would say would be as a result of a traumatic event like that. But I want you to know that when I was four years old and I screamed at that thing, I believe that Jesus walked by in the form of my grandparents. And they didn't ignore it. But they reached out to me and said, in Jesus' name, you're healed. And so I stand before you today saying, look at what God has done. Sheena. 
got three beautiful daughters. And we have a plan to plant a church in San Francisco. Look at what God has done. The great part about it is not done. And it's not done with any one of you guys here today. So wherever you find yourself, whether if it's in a good spot or whether you're kind of like, oh, I'm just trying to get through, Pastor. I'm just trying to get through. I want you to know that Jesus is passing by. And in this moment, your blindness, your muteness, your ability, inability to walk, whatever it is that this morning, that Jesus is here. And he's looking at your situation, not saying, oh, well, they'll be all right. No, he's saying, no, 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 no. This is the opportunity. You've been waiting for someone to come do, I don't know what you've been waiting for, but this is the opportunity today. For you to walk out of this place radically transformed, not because of me or not because of the wonderful music, but literally because Jesus is stopping right here inside of this moment to touch you. And so I'm just going to have everybody bow your heads, close your eyes, every single person. And, and if you are here and, and you this morning, maybe it's not physically, maybe it's spiritually, you're blind in some area. That there's a sense of just lack. Maybe it's a child who doesn't know Jesus as the personal Lord and Savior. Maybe it's finances. I don't know. Whatever it is, I just imagine this time to raise your hand and I want to pray for you. I want to pray that Jesus will come in the middle of your circumstance and he will bring healing. And not just restore, but to bring wholeness to that situation. Thank you, Jesus. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you this morning. And God, you are the business of healing people. And so every single hand represents a life. Every single hand represents someone who's valuable to you. And so, Jesus, I lift up every single one of them to you. And God, you know what to do with people. Even sometimes when we lack the wisdom and the insight and, and, and even the words, God, you know what is needed. And so, God, I just pray that you would heal Restore marriages, God. Yes. Meet needs financially. Thanks. God, I, I pray, Father, that even right now, Lord, for that son or for that daughter who does not know you, God, I pray that they would be in intimate relationship with you. Yes. And I pray, Father, that we would ask the right questions at the right time, in the right season. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Then we're going to throw the reflection questions up there. And um, the first one is, is, are we asking the questions that lead to walls coming down or to walls coming up? The second one is, what questions should we be asking? Just kind of be reflecting on those this, this, this week as we go out and change our community.